Creative Vitality Jam Sessions. Here we have intimate conversations with extraordinary dance and theater artists about reimagining creativity and supporting and building community. Now is the time for action, to walk the walk, for equality, justice, and respect for all human beings. Please go out and join one of these demonstrations. They are a testament to solidarity and allyship. I'm Helen Pickett, and today's guest is Virginia Johnson, the Artistic Director of Dance Theater of Harlem in New York City. We have known each other since 2010. Virginia, hi. Hi, Helen, good to see you. You too, it's been so long, and especially since we live in separate cities now, and thank you so much for being uh, on Creative Vitality Jam Sessions. Oh, it's my pleasure. Oh, my goodness, thank you for asking me. Um, I just want to speak um, a bit of your accolades because they're quite extraordinary. What I didn't get to say because I was so happy you came on so soon is that um, you're a true inspiration for someone who has devoted their life to this art form in so many, so many ways. So as a reigning ballerina of Dance Theater of Harlem, a founding member, that a career that spanned 30 years, you were recognized as one of the great ballerinas of our time. You were the founder of Point Magazine and the editor for 10 years. Um, you were the recipient of numerous awards. Uh, I mean, you're the example of, of, of what a woman is doing in this field as a leader in so many different areas. And I would, I would love if you feel like it for you to elaborate on, on, you know, on what you're doing and, and your life a bit more for us. Wow. <laughs> well, that's a lot. You know, I think Helen, the thing for me is that I've been so incredibly fortunate. I fell in love with this art form at a very young age. I wasn't necessarily good at it at a very young age, but I really fell in love with it. And uh, I seem to have always been in the right place at the right time. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly grew up in, growing up in Washington, DC, I came from a very supportive environment. Um, and in today's, in today's world, in the situation that we're in, I'm realizing that it was a very segregated environment. You know, the black community and the white community in Washington were um, living in parallel worlds. Mm -hmm. I had a definite, um, middle class upbringing, but it was a, a black middle class up, upbringing mm -hmm. and a very nurturing one. Uh, and that's where I had my first ballet lessons. Um, when I went, went on to the Washington School of Ballet, I crossed over into the white world. And, you know, I think the thing is that I was so in love with this art form that I didn't notice if anybody was treating me differently. I didn't notice if there was any issue or that actually I was, but I didn't notice that I was the only one because I was doing this thing that I loved so much. And I got such wonderful support from Mary Day. Um, and I, you know, I've told the story so many times of uh, when I was graduating from the academy at the Washington School of Ballet, Mary called me into her office and she said, you know, Virginia, you're gonna have a career, but you're never gonna be a ballerina because nobody's gonna hire you. They don't want black dancers. Now, now this is 1968 yeah. and the year that I graduated uh, was I grad my graduation was April seventh, and of course Dr. King was assassinated on April fourth, mm -hmm. and Washington erupted in riots and flames. There were there were armored tanks in the streets of Washington, uh, and I went from the black community across town to the white community to graduate from high school in that moment. So amazing. Um, so, you know, I think that Mary Day was a very wonderful person and she had, um, she had real vision, but she was talking the truth. Nobody was gonna hire me. Uh, but I still knew I loved this thing. I just mm -hmm. loved it so much. Uh, so I came, I got myself up to New York. I was at New York University and uh, somebody said that Arthur Mitchell was uh, teaching ballet classes on Saturday. Cause I was at NYU and it was a modern program and I missed my ballet. And I, I went up and I found out that he was not only teaching classes, but starting a company. Ugh. 
and you know, I had to go through a lot to convince my parents that I should drop out of college to do this, but we, they finally said that I could. Um, and you know, Helen, it was amazing to me because it is the 1960s and the civil rights era and something's beginning to dawn on me that, well, maybe there's something a little bit wrong with, with me, a black person loving ballet so much. Maybe I'm not being true to my heritage. Maybe I'm not being true to myself. Mm -hmm. so I had these very, very big doubts in that period of time about this thing that I loved so much. And then I came to Dance Theatre of Harlem and um, that first company of people, all of us had been told no. You yeah. can't do this. You don't belong. And so that gave me purpose. I was like, damn it, I'm going to show you. We're yeah. going to make this happen. And Arthur Mitchell was an amazing leader. He was such, um, he knew what had to happen and he knew how to make it happen. And my career at Dance Theatre of Harlem was astonishing in every way, in every way. I feel very proud to be part of this organization because it was about breaking down barriers. Yeah. Um, so flash forward 30 years and uh, finally retire. <laughs> finally retire. <laughs> and you know, know. Then, uh, it was like, okay, I've had it with ballet. I just like, I, it's, 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 I've given it my life. I, I, I want to be a real person. I want to be in the real world. So <laughs> we're at college uh, and I was at Fordham and somebody said that they were looking for uh, an editor over at Lifestyle Ventures. And I went over to interview for this job and they said, to, um, okay, uh, we're thinking it was about starting a ballet magazine. What do you think should be in it? And I thought about all the things that I wish somebody had told me when I was a professional dancer about being a professional dancer. Yeah. All the things that I needed to know to survive in this art form. Because all the publications up to that point were looking at ballet from the outside. But when you're inside the art form, there's stuff that you have to understand. And there's support you can get. And there's information that makes you a better artist and a better athlete and a better citizen of your world. So that's what I told them. I said, oh, good, okay, we'll do it. And you'll be the editor. Yes. Is that wacky? Well, it's not wacky. You know, you you always, I mean, since I've known you, we've, you know, our, I remember our wonder, we have had wonderful breakfasts. I mean, yeah. we, both, we both speak about how fortunate we were in our careers. We've both spoken to that. But don't you also believe that intention because what I heard, heard you say for in the beginning is how much you loved, you loved ballet. You know, you, regardless of being told you're not gonna have a career, you moved to New York, you love ballet. You had your ears open to hear about Arthur Mitchell who was giving ballet classes because you missed ballet. Intention yes, yes. has so much to do with how, what you said earlier, being at the place at the right time. Don't, wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. I think that that's a, intention is a very important part of, um, I don't want to say success because I think that, of course, if you have intention, you're likely to have success, but it really is an important part of being a human being to understand why you are and what's important to you and what you need to do to make that happen. And that's all of what's inside of intention. It's not that you're passively waiting for the world to come to you and give you blah, 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 because of whatever. It's because you see this and you figure out how to make that happen. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of fuel that is so crucial in life. That's beautifully said. It is a fuel. And it also, I also say, I feel like um, when I'm really in that intention, for example, when I'm making... Um, making something new. I feel like my antenna, like I have not just two, but I feel like my whole sensory system is like, you know, it's like the cilia in your ear or something, you know, I feel like, I think that's also intention because it makes you open exactly. to allow these opportunities also, or it may, let's not say allow, it makes you open to see perhaps. Mm -hmm. To receive. There you go. Yep, yep. No, I think that you're right because um, there, there are, are a couple of things involved there. You have to have focus and you have to have this kind of doggedness to it, but you can't be closed. I think yeah. that, that hairs in my head. Um, so so you, when you're, I love what you said, 
that when you set out to do something, then you become aware of your sense, sensitivity to things that might connect that you didn't know about opens up. Yeah. And you get a chance to um, synthesize that stuff. So it's a combination of being completely focused and completely open at the same time. Yeah. It creates another kind of awareness that makes creativity possible. Yeah, and spontaneity. Let's not forget that is, that's a big part of our when you're present in your art form. You have to that openness is allowing <laughs> being ready for the <laughs> for the time when you're like, I didn't expect that to happen, you know, and being able to roll with it. Is it true for a choreographer as well? Oh yeah. Oh really? Absolutely. Oh yeah. Not so. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I I feel like I've been through every. Um, Anything that could happen, I feel like uh, did happen. And now I know that things can come out of left field and they might happen and they probably will happen. And, you know, it's, it's the same thing, you know, adapt or die in a very uh, kind of, but in a very kind of cut way, you know, it's like, I better roll with these punches or this thing's not going to happen. Wow. Absolutely. You know, but, hey, I, I can't, it does, it makes, me stronger. <laughs> well, I always think of a choreographer as somebody who is in control. And so, and you are, but you're also extremely subject, aren't you? Yeah. Wow. That's hard. Well, like, isn't that with everything? You know, let's just, I mean, being an artistic director, mm. I would say, I would feel like an artistic director has a certain amount of control, but man, what you deal with every day, look what you're dealing with now, Corona, right, right, COVID-19. Right. If yeah. this isn't, you know. No, and I, I wouldn't characterize an artistic director as somebody who is in control at okay. all. Okay, good. <laughs> appearance of the expectation that that person is in control, that is both a very great help, but also is, a very great lie, right? Bring forward because you are you have so many forces all around you that are not necessarily supporting, but that you have to make use of. Right. Wow. Let's see. Um, you have reimagined yourself uh, numerous times in your creative life, probably in your real life as well. Um, can. You've shared many examples, um, but what about oh, has, how has one of those shifts, one of those great shifts, you know, that shift between um, reimaginings, how has that shift motivated you or redirected or refocused you as a person or your creativity or how you thought about you yourself as a creative person? Oh, that's, um, that's tricky. Um... I think that uh, I'm a very curious person um, and I like to understand what's in front of me as much as I can. So I, I do a lot of observing and, and research and, and trying to put things together so that they make sense to me. I, uh, I think that, that I have this thing that happens to me, Helen, it's, it's a very weird thing. Um, probably about a year or eight months before some change comes in my life, I get these things called the change chills. <laughs> and I get, some, they're like chills that run up and down my spine that make me go, oh, something's getting ready to happen. Oh, what is it going to be? Well, what should I do to prepare? And because you don't know what they are, but just that change is coming, then you start paying attention differently to your everyday life. And you can see that, okay, if I'm not gonna have that, then that's okay. And if I'm not gonna have that, so that when I get to that moment where it happens, whether I've made the choice or whether it's made for me, and both have happened to me, then I'm in a, a very neutral place a place where I can go, all right, then I'm going to try this. It's really weird, it's really a weird thing um, to have that premonition and then the space that allows me to 
not be thrown by change. Yeah. You have your chills, but what you just said also, premonition, I think that perhaps more people, and this speaks to what we were speaking about earlier, if we are tuned in, perhaps we do get those signs. Mm -hmm. but it's whether or not we can listen again. Right. Right? Now you have a real physical manifestation. That's extraordinary. It's weird. It's weird. I haven't had them for a while. I'm wondering, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. Well, maybe that's okay. So we haven't had for that's all right. That's good. Let's sit here for a while, right? Um, so, um, can you have? Can you share, uh, or do you have one or two favorite memories from your creative life, whatever iteration, in whatever iteration you know, whether it's a ballerina as a ballerina. Uh, as a as an editor, as a university, you know, in the university, mm -hmm. do you have is there is there a memory, a standout memory, that you can share? And it, was there insight involved in this memory? So did this was this favorite memory a favorite because it also had an idea of. Um, something that, that brought you further or sparked magic, uh, you know, inspiration? Hmm. That's really, that's really a tough one. That's really a tough one. Um, I haven't actually ever felt like I've been a creative person. What? Wow. Necessarily ever made anything officially, you know? I'm looking for that creative moment to happen next. What I've been doing in this, all these iterations of my life, you know, is um, uh, being a servant to uh, an idea that I'm filling in, you know, that I'm, I'm addressing. You know, certainly in my dancing career, it was a servant to this, this art form of, of performing ballet and that I was being that continuity between generations. And this was my time to, to pull the boat, and so I was pulling the boat. Um, I think that point was probably more creative than than that because it was coming out of out of nothing actually. Uh, and I think that I've never considered it as being creative, but now that I'm thinking about it, I see that there is that um, because it was fulfilling a need, you know a group of people, a body of information being that connector. Yeah. Um, uh, being an artistic director is also a kind of creativity. Once again, a servant position mm -hmm. to many, many factors. Um, sometimes I fantasize that oh, I'm making this and the dancers are my instruments and I'm Creating and the blah. <laughs> That's really not it. <laughs> it's, 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 you know, um, making possible this idea of ballet as an art form that belongs to everyone yes. is not creative. It is a service mm -hmm. that I'm providing. These beautiful dancers, giving them a place to grow. Uh, putting them in front of audiences, giving them a chance to see something that they had not imagined, or worse, had imagined should not be. Hmm. You know, so, so that so that's not really creative. That's just, once again this this threw me to there. Yeah. So I do have this fantasy of actually writing novels. Which oh yeah, really creative, and I'm going to do that, and then I'll talk to you about creativity. I bet you have had those chills. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that would be wonderful. Yeah, because it's funny. I, I look at you. Also, you know, I looked at you from afar for so many years, right? Um, and then met, and then meeting you, and I always thought of you as a creative force. Wow. So maybe it's how we as individuals see creativity because 
I differ with you uh, in terms of a dancer. I believe a dancer, yes, we are the servant to, you know, the choreographer's voice, the director's voice, you know, and we are serving and we're serving an art form. That is true. But your time on stage when you're a dancer and how you drop into that moment and how you, for example, interpret Giselle. We both know, I mean, maybe you didn't do this. I certainly did at some point where I had a great show and I thought the next show, it was so great. I have to, I have to recreate that thing. And then that show is, a, is, a, is crap because there is no recreating live performance. The, the, the beautiful thing about maturing as an artist, as a live performance artist is having that moment when you actually realize it's the present, the present's the only thing that can make this magic happen. Don't you think that's creative? <sighs> See, I'm in a total agreement with you. <laughs> I just haven't put that word to it. Hmm. But you, yes, you're right. You're 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 making something unique happen in that moment that can't happen without all the things that you've done to make that moment happen. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're creating your body on a daily basis. All the upkeep. <gasps> Do you know? Like yeah. So anyhow, maybe it's semantics, you know, but um yeah. Um Okay, so do you have a favorite movement tip or exercise that you, like a go-to exercise thing that you love to do? Anything to tell the Creative Vitality audience? Yeah, you know, this, uh, this period of, of quarantine has been pretty awful. Um, and I certainly have uh, engaged in what I can actually call a meditation practice. Oh, great. I think it is something that I did occasionally but it's something that I find very much important part of my daily coping. And um, no, coping makes it negative. My daily thriving as an individual in this world. Uh, and, and it's been great because it's been, it's been great. Uh, but I also, I, I was a swimmer, you know, when I stopped dancing, I, I tried a lot of different things to try to, um, to this aging body needed help, you know, and, and, uh, Nothing really stuck with me. Um, and then I, I learned how to swim. <laughs> and I uh, have become a regular swimmer and it's just a joy. Now, of course, with the gyms closed and the, the pools closed, I can't do that. So I have a Nordic track that I found at a thrift store yes. maybe 20 years ago. It's one of the old wooden ones. <laughs> it's a joy, you know, you just very soothing, very purposeful. You're just like, you can imagine that you're doing something or you listen to a book or, you know, I listen to a radio program I like to, to because it, it is a little re repetitive, but it, it does keep that, gets the heart rate going. And that's exactly. those endorphins. They're a very important part of your mood adjustment. <laughs> I totally agree. That's what my forest walks do. Yeah. You know. You need you know. You need to get your heart moving. And so yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's a regular every day. I should be stretching more. I, the, the company's rehearsing right now via Zoom. And we do class and we do point class. And last week I had somebody come in and do a uh, yoga class. And I turned off my camera and I did the yoga class and hurt myself. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Oh. Better at this. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, I, I hear you with the stretching. I hear you. I, and whenever I avoid it and say, I just want to sit down, I say flexible body, flexible mind. That's right. That's good. That's good. <laughs> you know, like if you get stiff here, you're going to get stiff here too, you know. <laughs> um, as a part of uh, the CVJS platform, um, we believe in supporting and building community. Uh, and I think this is a pertinent question now. It's always pertinent, but now it's very pertinent. What would you like to see shift in terms of building an equitable, more equitable community, whether that be the ballet community, community in general? That's... 
Well, you know, I think that, that we should think about community in general. In general, I think that the ballet community is a very specific part of it. And, you know, do you know about the Equity Project? It's been a yeah. three years thing that we've been doing with, in partnership with Dance USA and International Association of Blacks in Dance. And we brought together um, uh, 20 ballet companies to try to sort through just what is the problem. Mm -hmm. three years, and I feel like we haven't gotten where we need to be, but we've made such amazing, amazing progress. And this, this time period has been very painful because we see how much further there is to go. Yeah. Helen, the real thing is that America needs to think about this differently. Yes. It's not a black problem. This is exactly. Not, not like this. And we're not keeping us down. We are not keeping us down. So until America actually starts to become aware of institutional racism, how structurally baked into our everyday lives, this idea that black people are bad and separate and can't and won't, and we have to be afraid of them, until we get to that place, that's not us. No. So I'm very hopeful when I look at these demonstrations and the demonstrations sweep through Columbus Circle twice a day, and I look down and I say, and you know, there are a lot of young people, a lot of young people, not just young people, but they're so mixed. And, and I, I look with this next generation and think, well, you know, my generation did a lot. Yeah. This next generation is going to take us further. Right now we're in this kind of watershed moment where old people like me are actually losing power, which is a good thing because old people like me, we have our mindsets that are stopping change. And the, when the mindsets change, the world can change. So I'm very hopeful. I'm very scared because we've got a great distance to go, but I see it as being something that is now being owned beyond just, you need to do this for me. It's much more, you need to understand what you are doing to the and it's, it's really, it's, I see so many friends and they're reaching out to me. It's like, what can I do? It's like, don't worry about me. I'm, I'm a very privileged person. But what are you doing to the people in your life to support their development? Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree. I agree with everything you, I agree uh, uh, as an ally with everything. And um, I feel like uh, I have worked toward now I got more specific. I worked toward the, in the ballet world. I worked toward getting, um, and we've spoken about this, companies to look more like the face of America. I advocate, I believe in ethical casting. I, I believe in all of this because it is, um, it's like you said, it, it, this is not favors. This is, <laughs> this, this is, has nothing to do with that. Right. You know, so thank you. Virginia, um, I wish we lived closer. Um, I really, maybe one of the first things I'm going to do is, you know, come to New York and camp out at a friend's house and just have breakfast with all my friends that I miss so much. It's been, you know, it's been too long. Um, actually, an anecdote, um, I recently talked to my friend Tony Ritzy, who I danced with in Frankfurt. And he and he saw that you were going to be on the show, and he said, "I danced with Virginia in a club in Paris." Oh my god! <laughs> wow! And 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 he said, "I you know I saw her a number of years later, and um, she didn't remember the night, but I reminded her." And, and Virginia, you said that you were thrilled with the memory, so I just had to. I think it must have been when we were on tour in Paris, Frankfurt Ballet, and you know, you were, anyhow, he remembers a great night with you. Gosh, you know, those, those performing years were so amazing, and we got to go to such amazing places, yeah. and there were those club nights, and it was so fabulous because there would be all kinds of people, all of us just dancing the night away, after having done performances, but you know, releasing in a different way. It's That's so right. Oh, that I could get. What I can't get now is that I could do a performance, dance all night, and get up and take class. What? <laughs> I, used to, I wish I had some of that again. I know. Virginia, thank you so much. If you don't mind staying with me while I say the last credits, and then we'll say goodbye to each other. Um, 
Uh, it was a, a beautiful chat. Thank you so much. Please go to dancetheaterofharlem.org. Is that right? To find out more about this exquisite company. Um, I have had the luxury of working a couple of times, setting the duet a couple of times, and it's a truly remarkable place. Beautiful dancers. Um, so please log on to their website to find out more. Um, CVJS is live twice a week, Wednesday at two and Sunday brunch at one. And our next guest is Kirsten Fetroy next Wednesday. That's right. Yeah. 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 And um, so when CVJS is uploaded to our YouTube page, we will find in the description box below bio information, uh, information on our social media and various other stuff. Um, I want to thank the excellent young Jedi, Gracie Spina, for being behind the scenes and, you know, helping all this uh, happen. I want to thank the resilient and beautiful dance community. I'm honored every day to be a part of you. Thank you for watching. Virginia, uh, it was a joy. Thank you so much. Keep reimagining creativity. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Wonderful. Bye.